right, on that note, uh, John, you're we, we so we do have a number of items. So let's try to be fair because the we try to leave the presentation discussions um, tend to have longer discussions, and if we don't have a longer discussion, then what's the point of having a discussion? So um, base image. What well, actually? Can we do the base image annotation proposal? Because that one I think will be short, and we can time box that at maybe seven minutes. Uh, oh, it says Jason can't attend. Uh, yeah. John, what do you want to do in this one? You were kind of shepherding this one. Do you want to just kick it to next week? John? All I see is minus 20. Holy crap. Um, <laughs> oh, my dead, maybe sec. Okay, hold on. Um, right. First of all, here's our hack. So everybody, please sign in. Um, okay, I was trying to, to capture more. Uh, so with that, why don't we get to uh, content editing? Uh, well, John can't do that one either. John, if you can't talk, we're going to just punt all your stuff to next week. Sorry, you can talk. All right. Sorry, the floor is now yours. Uh, sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was the one who originally made the issue, and this is like my first time petitioning or going to the OCI uh, for respect stuff. Uh, so yeah, I'm a little new to this, I guess. Um, but uh, we basically have a um, registry that has on the order of hundreds of thousands of images in it. And we did some analysis and we looked at what being able to serve specific customers, specific formats uh, would entail in terms of uh, CPU overhead and how much benefit that would have in terms of their container start times or container push times for, build, uh, for builders. And what we found was that different users have significantly different benefits from different compression algorithms. For example, in the data center where networking is super fast, um, having no compression is ideal. And uh, the OCI image spec added the ability to have layers without uh, compression in them. So you can just upload a tarball layer as opposed to a tar zip, uh, G zip layer. And uh, for uploaders, for example, or for, excuse me, home users, um, doing a very high level of z state compression uh, is actually beneficial, even though it's very CPU intensive. It turns out now that everyone's working from home, you know, people have like 10 meg internet, you can spend all the CPU time in the data center and it, it pays off. Um, sure, so based on the, go ahead. Sure, pros and cons. So yeah, yeah you're never going to make everybody happy. Right. And the current um, distribution spec and image format don't allow for different users to get different re-encodings of the same layer um, or different compressed versions of the same layer, um, unless you de duplicate that in the image itself. Um, and that just becomes wasteful in terms of storage server side. Um, and it doesn't allow for, for upgrades in flight. Um, so the proposal kind of talks to uh, primarily a, uh, adopting the HTTP content encoding spec, which allows the server to serve up different encodings of the same file format or same file, excuse me, um, to different users, depending on, on, you know, how, how they decide to set their accept headers. There's a small part of the, the uh, issue that describes a mechanism to determine, um, which content encodings are available for uploaders um, because HTTP doesn't allow for the um, uh, client to like interrogate the server um, in a trivial way. So uh, that's, that's really the only extension there, but the, the, the big benefit is on, on download. Can you explain a little bit how, how that would work with the content encoding? Uh, on the download or the upload side? Uh, either. Or on both. Um, so the, 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 the download side, um, like in the data center, 
we would configure all of our Docker daemons to pull and say, you know, accept um, identity or accept encoding identity. So don't ask for a compressed version um, of the, the data. Uh, and it would serve the tarballs as is, or, you know, 302 U to, to S3 with the tarballs as is. Um, for home users who are doing like a Docker pull, um, it would uh, be able to do on the fly compression for images that have not been fetched before. And then the first time you fetch a layer, it would be able to re-upload it to the S3 store with uh, after doing compression with that level and subsequent pulls would be 302 to that new pull. That's like the very specific of how we're planning on doing this. And we do this with um, our like Java tarballs or, or Java jars, for example. Um, but it's a... Uh, it's our approach. You could also do this with like Apache too and just rely on its uh, standardized behavior, which is on the fly compression and no caching. So in this case, the actual images are referencing uncompressed descriptors? Uh, they would have to reference uncompressed uh, tar layers in order for this to work. Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. I I love yeah, that was going to be my um, I like concern also is if the yeah it breaks the content adjustability if if you're somehow expecting the registry to re-encode the layers but if it's just yeah if it's just on the content transfer I guess that makes sense yeah unfortunately there's not really a way yet to tell people that they should upload their manifests without compression. Um, but that's something that like, at least we own some of the build infrastructure so we can start to migrate people to doing that um, in, in add a rejection policy when we have enough people moved over. Um, but right now, if they upload a tarball, it's super slow um, because their, their upload time is just um, like abysmal and uh, they're uploading 10x the amount of data because it's uncompressed because there's no way to say, you know, upload this in a compressed fashion. Um, and then in the data center, like they want uncompressed when we're pulling there. It's this, it's this asymmetry of like the builders are very different machines than the runners. Yeah, yeah this, this, this gets into some of the CI V2 conversations I've had around like the, the ideal, ideal image format, format depends on the client. client. And it depends on the server. server. So, so like some, some things are way faster, faster at build time, time versus at pull time, time versus at run time, time versus at push time. time. And allowing, allowing the registry to make some decisions around this, around this um, and the allowing clients, clients to tell the registry, here's my name you, it unlocks a lot of those cases, cases that are currently impossible. The one other thing that's not in the proposal as today, um, because the um, standard is not standardized upstream yet um, is uh, for Zsted custom dictionary support. So this was a case where we found um, doing offline dictionary generation can get us um, almost a, like we already have like a 90 something percent compression factor um, and it can get us from like the 93, 94 to like 97 to 98 percent compression factor. Um, so it's a, a, a pretty significant one you can get from doing offline compression. I, I think we all recognize the, like I was watching the Red Hat Container Day things today and uh, there was three different sessions on the compression formats and NIDUS and different approaches and so forth. So I think we were all seeing that and to Mike's point, like there's, there's always trade-offs and how do you support both, whether we're all working from home and how long that works or, what does a product like Docker Hub do, which for the most part never has somebody close to it. It's always meant to be far away. So it, you want it to have um, the optimization for the internet, but yet for all the private registries for customers, they should have the optimizations of the fast network. And hopefully their registries are always right next to their compute, not cross region poles. So they, and then how much does the author need to play a role in that difference? Um, like this is, like, you know, we're experimenting this with a teleport. We see, you know, like we, we try to make it completely transparent to the user. The user uploads it, we expand it. There's teleport nodes that know how to say, they ne negotiate, say, hey, I'm teleport enabled. Are you in the same region? Do you, is that expanded? Yes, yes. 
then bang, it's done and it's much faster. I think the problem we're facing is where does that happen? How is it exposed to the users? Then we have this infrastructure that's made on these content, on these digest and descriptors that assume a certain way that the digest is formed. And if that's changed, what does that promise mean? The other thing I'll just add that one of the reasons I've been pushing back and concerned about this is you know, we keep on assuming that registries, which are generally speaking, dumb storage devices, right? The, you, there's a Gazintas and there's a Gazaltas. And we promise that the Gazalta is the same thing that went in. Um, between the tough stuff, looking for updates and timestamps, between some of these th conversations where we're doing conversion on the fly, not only is it going to be compute intensive, uh, potentially, um, but it's also a matter of, are we should we be changing content on the fly? So I just I, I just wanted to raise those two concerns for us to think about how do we incorporate these. So so, so in your first point about um, digest, since this is not like you do the digest after doing the encoding decoding step, um, or I guess before the encoding step and after the decoding step. So the content encoding and the like content addressable nature of the store have nothing to do with each other. Um, this content encoding is just like an artifact of the fact that the registry protocol is over HTTP um, and uh, storage on disk will all be this, this, the same. Um, and then the other thing is like, it's totally opt-in. There's no demand that the user has to, or the registry has to do on the fly um, mutation. Um, you can still allow users to upload with manifests that have tarballs in them that are compressed with GZIP. Um, I would say that like, it would become it, it, it is becoming very exorbitant to do ZSTID plus GZIP plus uncompressed and storing that at rest. And that's becoming more expensive compared to the compute, at least from the economics um, in AWS. I, have you done the cost in the compute? Like that's that's part of the storage is not free, right? We, we don't necessarily charge as much as we should. and. It, it's not just the size of the storage. It's also, um, there's just a bunch of overhead related to how many list APIs can support how many objects, the deletion management, then the, the in this case, it helps with that, that. It doesn't, doesn't hurt, hurt right? right? The, 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 this this enables, enables you to do better, better than you could really have. really hard to hear you, John. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. I, I yeah, I don't know if you got another mic or something, and it's hard to win um, if you have another option. So this is yeah, just. I guess I I sort on, of see the wire. this. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we, we're both sort of talking at the same time. So this is just a, a request for on the wire compression over HTTP, where the client and the server are going to compress and decompress based on the requested compression format. Right for the protocol. Uh, it, it allows for them to do this. It does not require them to do this. Right, right, fair. And then the, I mean, there's also the opportunity of doing lazy uh, pulls. So we've got a star GZ uh, little little thing that we could show off right in container D. Um, I'm not sure how that would affect this. <laughs> we have to take a look at that. Uh, you don't you don't want to have these compressed packets sitting in a in a cache and on the server for a very long time period, right? So, well, like, I, I, as far as I know, the star GZ format would not be significantly affected by this, okay. um, unless the server is trying to do on the fly compression because of the way that like some of the compression algorithms, the streaming compression algorithms require that you seek through the entire file before you do compression. Um, okay. So you're not so, just so, thinking yeah. on the wire, you're also thinking, okay, this, the server's probably going to cache it on in store. Yeah, like uh, the, the economics, going back to Steve's point, on upload, like we, storage is cheap for a day. And then overnight, compute gets really cheap. You run compression overnight at like ZSTID 13, and you compress overnight, and the next day, your, like, your compute was basically free and your storage cost has now gone down and you've cut it by 50%. And right. um, 
yeah, that's basically the, I think a lot of that purpose. happens, but we just don't expose what the, your, the current native compression is that we're using in the, in the store, right? Um, yeah. And, and also that we have no way of upgrading right now. Like if, if we go from Z state six as the default, which I think is the, what's in the image spec, um, there's no way for the server to be like, I want to use Z extreme, um, which can have significant benefits compared to the, whatever's in the image spec. Did, did the image spec say limited to, or it just had a list of proposed, you know, it, it requires that you use a specific level because the, um, image spec does the content, uh, digest after the compression. Okay. I, so the question is, what do we want to do as next steps? When I first saw this, I thought this was the other one where there was a negotiation to figure out how to not have to upload something that was already in there. Um, there's a little bit of feedback on it. What's next steps here? I haven't read this in detail because I just saw this today. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's broke. There's two parts of it. Um, I don't, I, I can turn it into more formal language and break up the two parts, um, if that's helpful. Um, but yeah, I don't, or I can wait for feedback on the issue before do, uh, doing that. Just an FYI, I'm looking at the language and it, and it literally only says, must have at least the, the you know, these, these formats, GZIP tar, right? It doesn't, it doesn't say you can't also have other formats. I believe that things go very pear-shaped if you start to mix and match gzip levels within a given registry. Um, and your, your costs kind of explode as well. I mean, I mean presently, presently, you don't, you don't have, have a choice, choice right here. Does, does my, my mic sound, sound any better? better? Have I, I fixed this? this? Is it still terrible? <laughs> A little better. Sorry, I'm also just trying to find my comments because I thought I commented on this, but I don't see it. So, Are we, we're on two. Sorry, I'm a stupid question. We're on two thirty-six, right? Yeah, only Justin and um, Vbats commented that I can see. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, John, I'm not. I, John, I think you're talking about the content encoding one. All right, why don't we give this some big time just because there's a few people that commented it's certainly a meaty one um and go from there and then because this encoding one is very much similar conversation i don't know well the encoding one's this. a little i think simpler for us to resolve um like that's it's, it's just it's just it's just, like, it's just adding functionality that's in http today uh, just formalizing it, uh, the duplicate ones. I, I still haven't wrapped my head around what, what that, that one's asking for. Yeah, this content encoding thing seems to me like just sort of pointing out that if you're very clever, you can like transfer it in different formats. And store in different formats on the server. Right, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that makes sense. Um, from the client side, I think the builder sides have been pretty cautious about just assuming stuff's not going to be compressed and throwing it up to servers because registries don't do their own compression today. 
Um, but if you have your own build pipeline and your own registry, then yeah, I think it, it completely makes sense to, to have more control over that. Okay, I think a couple of us got confused because Sargon was on 236, but he was wanted to talking about 235s. And so uh, I think we're a couple of us got confused on what was what. Um, anyway, all right, so what do we want to do with some next steps? I'm just literally trying to facilitate here. I would say formalize 235. Do we even discuss 236? I had that one open as well, but. Uh, I haven't talked about. about 236 at all. Yeah. So yeah, I think formalizing 235, like you mentioned, that, that makes sense. I'd, I'd like to see what like the formalized version of that would be so we can run, run through like where the client edge cases might be. Should I break up the um, description on how to handle upload negotiation? Because that's the part that's kind of outside of HTTP from the, the download side. And do you have a preferred ordering between those two? If, if you, uh, you want to explain that one. Um, so in the um, two-step upload process, um, the proposed idea is that uh, when you return the 302 um, to the like upload location, the session location, um, you would have a, sp a header, a custom header, which says which um, encodings the distribution prefers according to the HTTP uh, like weighted preference spec. Um, because right now there's no way for the server to say which encodings it prefers for upload. Gotcha. So uh, with, without that today, the clients would have to assume identity because if they start sending compressed content up, uh, I can, yeah. Yeah, our, our experience well. with playing with this with registries is that they just will take the content encoding and store the like double encoded version or the, the encoded version. And then when they serve it, they don't, they didn't like record that header. Um, so uh, things go really weird uh, right now. Uh, uh, so you need some way to tell, like have the registry say that I support this feature. So is, is are most registries ignoring the encoding? Yeah, uh, we played with, um, I think, so we, the, the standard distribution um, we used and I forgot the other one we used, um, but both basically just took the blob and stored it and ignored the content encoding header completely. Okay, yeah, that's not good. And then when they served it, they served the content encoded version without setting the header back. It's a blob. <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So maybe, on the maybe... on your registry implementation, are you are you keeping track of whether something's compressed or uncompressed, or are you doing some sort of heuristics on the blob? Itself? So where we are decompressing the blob on upload and storing it in S3 decompressed until the like cleanup process, the janitor comes along. Um, and then the janitor turns it into a Z-state version. Um, that, that, that's how we're going about it. Um, and then our registry um, can see if the z -state version exists and we'll serve that up instead. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of how a registry would, like just any generic registry would implement something like this, because uh, they don't necessarily know the content, uh, the content type that's being uploaded. They only know the digest in the end. Uh, um, I believe that they, I mean, they, they implicitly know the content type from the, um, when you upload the layer, like the standard clients will say yeah. the like VND yeah. blah blah blah. They 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 recognize it based on the media type. Whether anything's done with it is a different story. Because I think to Mike's point, I think we're generally just treating them as blobs. 
Yeah, where's that getting up? Where's that getting sent? In the in the manifest is what I what I meant. Oh well, yeah, that's the, but it's it's hard to connect the two, from like any generic registry. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, you, you could have a registry that's really smart, but if you have a registry, it's not necessarily the same. If you have a somewhat eventually consistent backend, right? For the most part, like the, the manifests are uploaded. I guess the same. The, the manifest is usually uploaded afterwards, anyways, in the flows. So you don't even know when you just you just start getting bytes coming up. You'd have to look uh, at core compression headers. The I mean the generic way to implement this is uh, say that you only accept the identity encoding and only store identity blobs. Yeah, I think. So would you upload the identity blobs first? and then have the registry look at that? So that that's so what we want to do, at least for our use case, is that people who are building and pushing on their laptops will compress with Zsted. People who are building in, in the data center will upload identity blobs. Um, and then any generic registry that wants to implement this would say, I only accept the identity encoding um, and store the identity encoded stuff in its blob store. How would uh, people on laptops be able to tell the registry I am going to upload this kind of uh, identity? Uh, so if the content encoding flag is missing uh, or not present, it is implicitly identity encoding. I guess the problem is, so the identity coding just means that it's completely opaque to the, the registry, but the content that comes up could still be compressed. So you could still end up double compressing stuff unless you actually look at the content right yeah. but like so yeah that's that's why i think like you you really if you're in an environment where you're controlling the build side and the registry it makes sense but if you're just like a generic registry service like it, it seems hard to uh, to handle that i think that like for the generic registry service they would just want to store identity and rely on the user to gzip their layer uh, appropriately. Um, and then on download, they can do smarter stuff than that, but they don't have to. So to put that another way, you're saying the use cases are extremely narrow for actually being able to get benefit out of this. If you have a completely dumb registry that can't re like uncompress and compress data. It's non-breaking, but if you had both the client side and the server side set up, you could you could do additional compression, right? Right. Or I mean if 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 either the client or the server had some level of intelligence um, you could get benefit out of this. If the client's expecting identity. But like if the server has intelligence, it can decompress on the fly. Fair. Which is like a, a pretty common thing for CDNs to have. Right, but the, the content addressable digests are on that compressed content. So whatever gets uploaded is what needs to be downloaded. Uh, but but the, the, you do the digest after you do the content encoding or decoding, excuse me, on download. And then on upload, you take the digest before you upload it. Right, but that digest is on whatever compressed bits you upload. So mm -hmm. either the client needs to know in advance that the registry is going to handle the compression and thus provide it the identity digest or the, the uncompressed digest and let the registry handle the compression or it needs to know that it should compress the blob and provide a digest that is the compressed blob. I mean, maybe, maybe it's best if I take the specification 
and break it into two and formalize language a little bit because there seems to be some misunderstandings about the protocol level compression versus the um, image spec related content addressability. Yeah, obviously you can't touch the content if it's part of the digest. I think that that's kind of what he's getting at though, that it, unless the builders are building with uncompressed data, you, you don't get any benefit from it. So, and you wouldn't necessarily automatically do uncompressed unless you knew you were, you were using a registry that was taking advantage of this. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, it makes sense to me. I, I would like to see like, if you want to formalize that, what, what it would actually look like. Cause it, it doesn't do any harm. I mean, it, it, it makes sense to have support for compression at the actual protocol level. Um, so I, I think it makes sense. And yeah, I understand how it's kind of weird here with the, the two-step upload uh, for doing that negotiation. Okay, I will go ahead and, and um, clean up the language and spot drop. I think that there's an interesting point around uh, what do you do about gzip and um, that's right. Did I read that right? Are you talking about the, TNO's the Z, question? The, the stars, the Z said stuff is uh, how do you, how does it get handled for double compression of the things being uploaded are already compressed? Uh, I mean, I, I, I can add this to the language, but like if a client is uploading data and it is a smarter client and it sees that the server side content or accepted encoding is identity gzip bz2 let's say um but it only wants to upload a tar gz blob because its builder built only a tar gz blob and the manifest that it has is only a tar gz blob it would then have to upload a uh, tar gz format with the identity encoding I'm just trying to wrap my head around the, the sequence of events is when does it get known, right? Because the blobs get uploaded. They get uploaded through the REST API. So there's, it's not like it goes straight to storage. So there's a chance to, to look at it. But the manifest is a, a separate asynchronous put, which has to be after the blob is sent. So it can validate it. Where is the understanding and correlation of the two? I mean, well, the, the client the will client. always know. The client always knows whether or not the blobs are compressed or not because they have the, the media type. The client knows, but when it sends it to the server, I don't remember. Basically, if it knows it's compressed, it's always going to use identity because the client okay. would then be knowingly doubling compressing, which the Fair. client should okay. never do. Just, I guess, sorry, just think through that, make sure you capture it, because for the, even the people that know somewhat about this, we're forgetting the particular put on that and to know what level of detail is known between the two. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll split it up into two and I'll do the upload one first, because I think that's the one that's more nuanced um, than the download side. All right, does that conclude the two? I don't actually think we, we talked about the I second one. Of that is, Sorry, go ahead. We, right. we, we had always intended that gzip wouldn't be the only solution. The, the intention was that you could extend the image spec to, you know, to have, have other formats as well. But this makes a lot more sense to just use identity, you know, basic tar when you're doing a push, pushes are, aren't, aren't the primary case, right? For using a registry, it's the polls. So if you, if this, this solution, I think makes more sense than, than the other prior discussions that we've had, right? Where we could just push an identity and then have that be, you know, negotiated between the client and the server on each poll. Good intentions, but I think we realized pretty early on that that wasn't the best idea to yeah. use up everything. And it, it was, we actually thought of pulling that back a few times in the clients. Um, but the reason we didn't is because, yeah, the, the havoc it would reach on uh, 
have it for registries which aren't handling compression at all, just bloat storage. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a difficult problem that the, the client, I mean, there's nothing stopping builders today from doing uncompressed. All right, now 236. <laughs> Sargon, you're back up. Uh, cool, yeah, so this one is uh, simpler, I think, uh, or at least less controversial. Um, it is a mechanism to extend the deduplication that uh, cross blob or cross repo mounting uh, kind of lets you do. Um, but it allows you to do this without having knowledge of the other uh, repositories that are uploaded to the registry. Um, the really common use case is that someone updates the Ubuntu base image. And then everybody in the company builds on top of that new Ubuntu base image and there's a Docker push. And then when they do the Docker push, um, they end up having to pay for upload time on those lower layers that the registry already has. Um, we don't have any way for um, one trusted clients to um, get a deduplication upload unless they do, unless they're able to figure out which other repository uh, has that store in it. And a lot of clients don't keep track of um, like a repository name to blob. Um, so this basically allows the uh, client to say, I am trying to upload file with um, blob descriptor SHA 256 foo. And uh, the registry then can do a proof of data possession uh, challenge against the client and allow the client to prove that it has this data to securely deduplicate at upload time. So I, I love the idea because this is a demo I've always hated that when I push an image that the registry should already know of, I have to wait for the upload for it to just say, yep, I already got it, but it had to upload it first. And then it just tosses it on the server. Like for me, the user, the expensive part was already paid. Um, the thing that I just always get nervous about is the disclosure challenge. So I think we just have to somehow specify that, and I'm just gonna look at Mike because I can see him standing there. If Mike and I have repos next to each other on the same registry and that registry you know, has decided that it doesn't allow sharing of layers across two security boundaries, then, then it shouldn't it shouldn't basically acknowledge that that layer exists because that basically tells me that that content already is in the registry and I could somehow circumvent it. Now, if Mike and I have the same permission boundaries and I happen to have probably push in addition to pull rights, then it makes perfect sense for it to be smarter and not upload um, and to be, you know, just say, um, don't even bother uploading and I already have it. Yeah, so there's, this is addressed in the um, proposal where uh, the registry can do one of two things. Um, it can either completely um, ignore issuing challenges and never issue a challenge, um, allowing the user to deduplicate, or it can always issue a false challenge. The issue with, uh, with this is that at push time, if the user tries to fulfill that challenge, um, you are open to a bunch of cryptography related timing attacks. Um, and that's called out explicitly that this does not try to be resistant to th this proof of data possession protocol does not try to be resistant to timing attacks. Um, and that trust boundary evaluation would have to be done at evaluation of the proof of data possession. Um, now saying that like a lot of layers are, you know, tens of gigabytes and the timing attack may be able to disclose a few bytes out of that image, um, at a time. And uh, for people who are hosting registries that have strict cross-repository tenancy requirements, um, you would not want to issue challenges. On the other hand, uh, registries like Docker Hub, if a Docker Hub um, uh, node has a, or Docker Hub store has a uh, public image, it can issue challenges against 
images that refer to blobs in the public, but you never want to refer to someone else's blob in the private. Uh, now that's complicated logic. So like, you know, for Docker Hub, it would probably never issue challenges. Um, but for corporate registries or, or other registries, like, you know, if you have an Amazon ECR, um, you might want to be able to do this. This is again, kind of the work from home use case of like, Everyone's working from home and Docker push is really slow. Yeah, I mean, look, we, it doesn't matter where, where we live, where we work. I, I haven't found a customer yet that, or I haven't found a scenario yet that some customer will complain about performance. Even when they're on the same node, there's always the opportunity to be faster. So I think it's just, if you address the, the security boundary acts issue and allow that negotiation to be done, because I, we've had this debate before here where some registries consider it perfectly fine to share images across org boundaries. Um, and because there's more, there's more beneficial savings in storage than the concern for, you know, hacking somebody else's layer for somebody else's image. Um, so I think there's just a trade-off. So as long as the, the registry and the client can negotiate that and let the registry decide what the boundary is for them, that point, that's why I kind of use Mike and I, as two repos, like it should allow cross repo mounting, not just in the same repo, but it must somewhere there must be a determination that says, but I actually do have the rights to Mike's repo, for instance. So it's allowed to, to do that. Um, I, th I think we're gonna see this more and more. It's not just working from home. We're pushing more and more for ephemeral client build environments because it's the only way to have a safe you know, uh, build. So does that mean that, that every one of those clients isn't gonna know about the images that are already pushed or the layers that are already pushed? So yeah. If you've got a secure store on each side and you can validate it, you got auth authentication, then you can trust what the client's doing because it's using your self or co-managed store as well, right? That makes sense yeah. to you. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing that you don't want, like e even if you say that like your challenge protocol um, is resistant enough to attacks that you're okay with like full sharing. Um, so like in a corporate environment, we're, we're basically fine with uh, disclosing that we have stored uh, a specific blob, but we don't want like um, HR to be able to, you know, fetch IT's blobs um, or vice versa if they're uploading across different parts of the, the repository or different parts of the, the registry. Um, so we need some way for them to prove that they actually have initial access to this blob somehow or initial possession of this blob. And that's what the proof of data possession protocol is about. And I think Justin was the one that brought up a um, uh, concern around the proof of data possession protocol and you know whether we would have a preference for a proof of data possession protocol that um, requires a ad hoc uh, generation of proof points or just allows people to store an unfinished digest. Um, the storing an unfinished digest is easy with SHA-256, but with the um, blob descriptors today, you can't easily do the other approach to proofing because you have to SHA-256 again over the entire blob. So you need to have a Merkle uh, tree construct for a hash. So like SHA-3 or Blake-3 or Blake-2 or similar. Okay, I, I think you're, but I think you're saying you're signing up to be able to detang or you know document tangle detangle that and give the options so we can. Yeah, I mean both proof of data possession protocols are in there. Uh, it turns out that like cryptography language is very uh, complicated, and uh, like it turns out we have one cryptographer at work, so I wouldn't want to bring a data possession protocol to them that it turns out is not. Uh, sufficient for most people's uh, security needs uh, it doesn't satisfy the trade-off. So I think what I would like is a um, an under like 
to understand what the community thinks in terms of minimal viable uh, security. Um, and then, you know, talk with folks internally to kind of get some formal language and, and get a formal de a definition of this, uh, this spec. Am I, so maybe I'm oversimplifying this. If I can pull, if that, if my layer has digest A, B, and C, just, uh, and I'm trying to upload it. And if I have pull rights to Mike's repo as well, so I have a graph access to his, if it's computer that my, one of my layers is digest A and, and I can, and as long as my identity goes to the registry, which obviously it does, as long as it can determine that I would have been able to pull cross mount to A out of Mike's repo, then I'm missing the concern because so, it's it really we're just talking about disclosure problem. So we don't really have the problem where, um, I guess there's two, two things. Like one, our clients don't necessarily know where they got those layers from um, because those layers were not handed, like they were given out via like, I think we're using build kit in build or something like that. And like, it doesn't keep track of this information. Um, and the, or, or people are pulling from Docker hub and then pushing to our internal registry. Sure. Um, so, so that's like, like, let's say Mike's registry is on Docker hub and everyone's building on top of him, his image. When people build and push to internal registries, the internal registry can't dedupe. Um, now, if you relax the guarantees to say that like, um, any repository can share blobs with any repository, uh, you can totally do what you're saying. Um, we don't want to completely throw security to, to the wolves. We want a little bit of security and being like, you know, you have to prove that you had Mike's blob at one point and you can't just probe the registry for random hashes to see if it has that in there or not. Um, the, spe the specific risk kind of is that like, um, let's say that there's a known vulnerable layer. Um, these security people publish these. Um, if you then probe the registry for all the known vulnerable layers, you could then use that to um, get to down you to can exploit them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But it, it, but let me just ask the question. And I don't try to pretend to be a security expert, but it, I, I just know about the disclosure problems. Is the idea that even though I do have pull rights to uh, pick up, continue to pick up Mike here. If I can pull all the images from Mike's, the so that the fact that I can discover digests, I actually I don't understand why that would be a problem. I'm still trying to find out why the vulnerable problems the thing. So, so, so I have don't have cross repository pulls. So right, he, he's talking about a different solution. You guys okay. are both wanting to solve the same problem in a different way. Yeah, I'm just but trying to say, like, the other if I thing pull is that an image don't... from Docker Hub and it's got digest A, B, and C, and let's say Mike and I share our registry and there's nothing in that registry yet. So I pull image from Docker Hub that has layers A, B, and C, and Mike pulls an image that has layers A, D, and E. When it, the first one of us that push to that registry will get layer A in there, and then let's say Mike goes first, and then I push whether layer A gets tossed because it got pushed to the registry and gets tossed because it, it knows it's deduped or the client could tell the registry, by the way, I have lay, I have a digest A. Do you know of, do you already have digest A that as my identity, you would have deduped anyway? So I guess I'm trying to. We have a slightly different security boundary where not everyone can read everybody else's repository, but we totally don't get have that. Totally good. Let's say you're a... also in it. I don't have access to yours. You're in the third repo in the same registry. Um, the way we actually do it in Azure is it's per registry sharing. And then we were discussing doing more granular. But if Mike and I have two different registries in Azure, even though they're ACR, we'll never share layers between each other. Two right, like... different teams in the same registry can share layers. But in the uh, case that I'm talking about, we have lots of different teams that cannot pull each other's image, right? but we want to be able to do dedupe across those and do this without allowing people to not steal other people's layers, but to uh, arbitrarily Stop. fetch other people's layers based on, on, on hash disclosure, because there's other parts of the system that disclose hashes of layers. 
I guess I'm being, I didn't really think about it as if I can't pull it, then I shouldn't dedupe it, I guess was the thought. So I was tying the permission boundary closer. And as long as it's defined, the registry can define what lay, like if, what I guess I'm trying to say is I know registries try to do different optimizations and we should allow that. So as long as a negotiation can figure out that I'm about to upload a digest A, the registry can determine whether it wants to consider that a dupe or not. And just says, I allow that to be deduped, so don't bother sending it to me. Whether it's because a registry allows trust. layers to be shared. If there's a mistrust. Right. Otherwise, uh, they could just have the copy of the manifest and be pretending. This is why I kind of keep it simple and just saying, if I can't pull it, I can't dedupe it. I mean, that can be... Um... In the proposal, that's also talked about of no proof of data possession and totally relying on the trust boundaries of the registry. Um, and that's a, a doable thing as well. And I think um, if that's where we want to start, I am fine writing up the language for that. And then if we wanted to get into more complicated use cases of like soft multi-tenancy, um, then there's extensions and I want to make sure that we leave a specification that's open to such extensions. Anybody else got a security hat that they have an opinion on this one? I think we want more security, not less. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm asking. Actually, I'm, I'm looking for other people that have a, an opinion. Yeah, private, that, that data, there could be privacy, private information in that data. We need to make sure that you have all of the data that you say you can push, I believe, when we, when we allow these pushes. Um, what about just being able to probe the registry? That's what I was about to say is, what if I just start making the registry to know whether or not it has the digest in the first place yeah. in the registry? But that's what I'm kind of getting at. If to know that the digest, the layer, the layer digest exists in the registry, if I could have pulled it, does it matter that I found out that it, it has it? Like, what's the, and I'm just asking, because I really, I'm trying to think, what is the problem? If I could pull that digest, what's you the problem? You can't pull that digest though. Where are you oh, if pull I it can't, from? then it shouldn't say that it shouldn't acknowledge it exists. Because you'd if have to pull, pull it from a different repository. But that's Thank what I'm know. saying, is my identity goes up with it. And if I couldn't have pulled it from wherever that digest is, because the digest is unique to, across all repos. If, the, if I couldn't have pulled that digest, then it shouldn't acknowledge it has it. That's the, the problem kind of comes into any time you need to do a Auth Z evaluation, you're like typically scanning through a big list and uh, you just do that in two steps. The first thing you do is you determine that this blob exists and then you look at everyone who can reference it and then you go through everyone who has access to those references and validate this. That becomes like a, a big timing vulnerability um, because like at least with something like S3, it's super slow. Like you have seconds between those steps. So if you know it, it takes zero seconds, you can say that this registry doesn't have this blob. If it takes one second, you can say this registry has this blob. But at two seconds, if it rejects you, then you know that this registry has this blob and um, you just don't have access to it. And in, in the reason why you don't want this beyond like, uh, is like if people probed our, our registry for say Java, layers to be able to determine all the job vulnerabilities that exist in our ecosystem or have existed in our ecosystem. So that, that, that's kind of where the like just relying on Auth Z constructs falls down. That's fair. So, so I would say like, you know, I, I, either we go with a completely insecure approach, which is just like, this is just a way to dedupe between everyone and everyone who talks to this registry has to trust everybody else, or you have to have a proof of data possession protocol. I'd be scared of anybody that says that we trust everyone. I guess here though, um, when does a reg registry actually return this uh, proof of data possession or this request for it in the first place? So where when the uh, user initiates the upload, they would say, I am uploading blob descriptor um, 
Fu, and the registry at that point can issue a challenge. But why would a registry issue the challenge? Um, like it can you you have two you have you can you have three choices. You can say I will never issue challenges. I will issue challenges on potentials of dedupes, or I will always issue challenges and just invalidate them. Um, from a from a security perspective, and, and this is where I need to go talk to our like crypto people and see if like those are all viable options um, before I like write language up around that. Um, but I think that if you just say like if if you just do the check of existence and don't provide a challenge if um, it doesn't exist, you might be able to get around the timing problem. I guess the, yeah, the point is usually the way we do these fallbacks is, yeah, if the registry is basically giving up the information that it has that blob already by issuing the challenge. And if it doesn't, then it really changes the protocol. Like if it always issues the challenge, whether or not it has the blob or not, then that kind of messes up the protocol from the client perspective. Because now they're always trying to prove they have something that the registry will make them upload the data anyways. Yeah, so I guess you have to do the auth check. Um, I guess let me think about this a little bit more then um, and see if there's a more secure way to do this. Otherwise, we, we have to, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we're already tossing dupes today. What I just, I just never really poked to figure out when that happens. Like, I know it gets uploaded. And then eventually we say, yep, we've got it ready and we toss it. Well, I don't know if that's done asynchronously later on or when that operation happens. So this whole auth check is happening. It's just, I haven't really poked deep enough to know where that check happens to know, like you're bringing up some good Depends on the registry though. Fair. That's I mean, the I client, like the client will never know. From the client's perspective, they don't, they shouldn't know. Like, yeah, there's probably, you could probably poke into any registry and there's going to be some sort of timing attack to tell like, oh, I uploaded something that already existed, but based on the response, but there shouldn't be anything in the protocol that leaks that information. I've got a hard stop. So um, till next, we'll just move whoever, there was one agenda item left, just move it to next week. Uh, the template's at the bottom and we'll pick up next week. Thanks, Thanks folks. Good, good talk, that was fun.